Good evening, everybody. My name is Mike Innes. I am a director of the Conflict Records Unit. Um, I have to state up front, uh, this, I, my affiliation with the, with the War Studies Department at King's College London. Um, I'm, a, I'm an honorary visiting research fellow, senior visiting research fellow in the department. Uh, by day, I work for the UN. I'm here in a personal capacity, um, personal and academic uh, capacity. Um, this evening's talk is with uh, Doug Cox on the subject of battlefield information, conflict records as evidence. Uh, just a few housekeeping points, and then I'll provide a few introductory points and then hand over to Doug. Um, the talk will, Doug's talk will go for 20 to 30 minutes roughly, and then we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards. Uh, for the Q&A, just use the Q&A function, um, post your questions, I'll moderate those, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll verbalize those and then Doug can engage with them. Um, the, uh, this is a webinar that is being recorded and it will be uh, posted on the War Studies YouTube channel, uh, which is a great channel. Uh, lots, of, lots of really interesting material on there. Um, and this will be joining uh, all the other material that the department puts up there, as well as uh, what the Conflict Records Unit has up there. Uh, this is our penultimate speaker event. We have one more uh, in March, on the 17th of March, with Michelle Caswell. Um, so um, I think with that, I, I'll just focus to, on, on a few basic introductory comments about Doug uh, and about uh, this evening and about my interest in, in, in Doug's work and uh, what Doug's going to be talking about. Uh, Doug is a law library professor at the City University of New York uh, School of Law. That's still current. I, I've got yes. that right. Yes. Yep. Uh, also a practicing attorney. Have I got that correct? Yes. And, and formerly uh, a U.S. Army intelligence officer as well. Um, and you led intelligence collection teams, document uh, exploitation type teams in... So I was mostly focused on signals intelligence. Uh, uh, okay. Yep. Both, uh, that was, which was done both some stateside, some... Uh, on deployments. Okay. Um, and Doug is also, importantly, I think Doug's also published quite a few important uh, articles that are really worth your time. Um, and they've been really influential in shaping my own thinking about, um, you know, the, the wide world of conflict records. It's, it's you know, conflict records that can mean a, uh, you know, a lot of different things, uh, but conflict records, document exploitation, battlefield evidence and information, captured enemy documents, there's kind of a, a wide world of issues that's sort of implied uh, under this rubric. So, so I, I'm really interested in, in what, Doug, what Doug has to say to this, uh, this evening. And without, uh, I, I suppose, uh, taking too much of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the spotlight, uh, I'll hand over to you, Doug. Um, and and uh, I'm looking forward to everything you've got to say. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, and I want to thank Mike for and the uh, uh, Conflicts Record Unit for inviting me. And also uh, a special thank you to Mike for suggesting this as a, an, an appropriate topic for today. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that is obviously the issue of uh, uh, the use of um, battlefield type information in court cases uh, is not a new thing ever since uh, Nuremberg uh, captured records uh, were utilized as, as evidence. Um, but it is also one that is uh, quite timely, and I will sort of circle back to this, but there has been a, uh, a sort of a flurry of activity recently in the past few years with the EU, uh, with NATO, with the United States, with the United Nations, uh, focusing on the issue of using battlefield information of various types and facilitating its use in uh, criminal prosecutions of foreign terrorist fighters. And I will come back to that, as I mentioned, um, but where I wanted to start with this, I just want to sort of hit three things and sort of uh, in, in my presentation. One is I want to sort of introduce the topic and some of the issues that arise with the, the use of this type of information as evidence by starting with a uh, where the rubber hits the road example, a real world example of this type of information being used in a court case that I think illustrates both how this uh, type of information can be a compelling and unique form of evidence. But I think it also illustrates how uh, we need to be careful with it. And there's some issues that can arise in those contexts that are, that are also unique uh, and create new, unique problems. Uh, the second thing I wanna cover is just talk a little bit about the sort of different phases of this process from the first phase being the collection of this type of information and the different forms that can take. Uh, the last phase being the use of this evidence in a court case. Um, and then uh, I think both of those get a lot of attention, but there's this sort of middle phase 
that is a little bit less transparent, it's more opaque, it's a little bit of a black box. And I think that that is a, an area where there, I think there needs to be a little bit more emphasis and there are some um, experiences that I've seen in that that uh, I think should, uh, are relevant to sort of how, how we should address those. And then finally, I, I wanna circle back to sort of some of these more recent uh, developments and activity surrounding this issue um, and hit some of the sort of bigger picture questions that are being discussed right now, such as, uh, questions of like, with this kind of evidence being used in courts, so is this the sort of thing where we need special courts and special rules and special laws and specially trained judges? Or is this an area where um, the um, normal judges and normal courts and normal rules are sort of up to the task and that we should rely upon those um, and, and some related issues as well. So with that, let me start off with, uh, I'm gonna share uh, my screen with just a few slides. Um, just to illustrate and talk, start uh, from an example of using this sort of information. So, so um, this example um, is real world, and I shouldn't have to say this, but I'll just um, clarify, of course, everything in here is uh, publicly available information and doesn't include any classified information from those cases. Uh, beginning in 2005, I uh, represented detainees um, in Guantanamo in their habeas corpus litigation. So it was the civil litigation side of that litigation. Um, and there was a significant quantity of battlefield information that was utilized as evidence in those cases. Um, and so we got sort of a, a firsthand look at some of uh, these types of issues. And I wanna just sort of present one of those examples of one. So as a uh, background to this, uh, you may recall, or you should recall the, uh, uh, when the US started operations in Afghanistan, there were individuals captured in Afghanistan, people arrested in Pakistan, uh, they were held by US forces and approximately 900 of them were then transferred to Guantanamo. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, because this sort of raised sort of rule of law questions, were they being sort of hidden there? Is it, were they sort of, were they taken to Guantanamo because of sort of a, a, a legal limbo? Uh, there were, was a habeas litigation filed. Um, uh, the detainees were incommunicado. Um, so the cases were sort of authorized by family members who believed they had a son there. Uh, the government's response was initially that these cases don't even belong in this court, uh, that um, these are wartime armed conflict detainees. Um, they're outside the territory of the United States. Uh, therefore, the, the court doesn't even have jurisdiction over this. That went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, where the U.S. Supreme Court found that these detainees do have a right to file habeas cases in U.S. federal court. And it was at that point uh, in 2004 that the government first was sort of forced to put forward evidence to support their detention. Um, and that came in the form of a variety of sort of unclassified descriptions of the evidence that they had. And I just wanna use one of them that came up in a number of cases. Um, detainee's full name and phone number were found on a seized computer, which was associated with an Al Qaeda operative. So this was initially, part of a court filing, and this was a unclassified um, description, one of several pieces of evidence being used in an individual case, right? And this is sort of an illustration of a type of battlefield information where uh, some, uh, some computer was seized in a place that was overrun, um, a computer was, was taken, it was exploited, uh, everything was sort of pulled out of it, even information that would have uh, perhaps been sort of superficially deleted. Um, and then this information came out and then was used in for military intelligence purposes. And then it, it comes forward as a form of evidence in the Guantanamo litigation. Um, it's also a piece of information that seems it's very specific. Um, the fact that uh, the specific detainee's name and phone number were found on the computer of an Al-Qaeda operative is a particularly sort of compelling piece of evidence, right? So this was just one piece of it. Now, at this time, um, after the Supreme Court case, it was still the case that the government's position was, even if they have the right technically to file a case in federal court, they have no substantive rights underneath it to enforce. And so they put forward uh, on the public docket, the uh, unclassified allegations such as this that supported the detention, but the underlying material they said was classified. 
Uh, and so no one had access to it, they, uh, except perhaps the court if they specifically requested it. Uh, this then was caused an additional skirmish between the attorneys and the government about um, if, they can, if, they're, if they are able to file a court case, they need to be able to meaningfully participate in it. And we need to be able to meaningfully participate in it on their behalf. We need to be able to visit the clients. We need to be able to have access to the classified information that's being used against them. Uh, the government uh, objected to this. Ultimately, we prevailed on these points. And so it started a process of one, um, facilitating initial visits. So the first visit I went down to Guantanamo was in uh, January, 2005. Um, and we went through a, uh, the uh, security clearance process. I had had a previous security clearance uh, in, when I was in the army, um, but I had to go through the whole process again for purposes of this um, to get access to the, these sorts of materials. So um, what I'm gonna show you next is from a public docket that is ultimately when there was filed on public docket and a redacted unclassified form of the evidence underlying this allegation. And it looked like this. So the, a, a few points here is one, um, this is not sort of the document on a computer itself. This is an, uh, a US intelligence report about a document on a computer. And it says subject lists the Mujahideen fighters, names, aliases, and family phone numbers captured in Pakistan. A couple other things to note here. Uh, warning, this is an information report, not finally evaluated intelligence report. Source information from this report was obtained from blank. All right. So this is uh, an unclassified version. Uh, and, and I specifically pulled one of these from uh, the one that was not my case, um, just so that we're staying with everything that's on the public docket. And then it eventually has a portion in it that lists a detainee's name and notes a phone number. So I want to Pause here and just to mention, uh, you know, a follow on effect of this, uh, which is uh, another issue about this. So this is classified evidence, the attorneys representing the detainee have access to the unclassified ver or the, the classified version. Um, but what's defined in sort of the redacted unclassified version is also marks the limits of what a detainee attorney would be able to share with the detainee in order for the detainee to participate in their um, defense. So, or participate in the case. So there was sometimes when if there's just limited information, it becomes very uh, sort of tricky to sort of even get some information that could be useful uh, in the case. Now, um, the other aspect of this being sort of an intelligence report is also uh, something that arises in some of the discussions about the use of battlefield information, which is, um, the idea that sometimes with the idea that it, so long as you get the evidence, then the evidence will sort of explain itself and will take care of itself and that's enough. But it is often the case as is here that you need contextual information to make that evidence useful. And so here, instead of just an, a, a plain document, it is an intelligence report that adds in that context. Well, where was this found? It, at whose house was this found, et cetera. Um, now, the, this can be, as I've said, sort of a, a compelling piece of evidence, but when you start digging under the classification, um, then you start to see more nuance. And when we uh, ultimately, and now I will transition to the ultimate opinion by the court that evaluated this piece of evidence, which sort of reveals some additional information in an unclassified form, which is that this list of captured fighters, the, the court notes, well, on its face, these could be a, a fairly compelling piece of evidence. But when we start adding in additional details and more information received from the detainees and others, um, the value of this information decreases. And in particular, the court notes that um, two of these documents were published on the internet or in newspapers. So, um, and the additional piece of information that, uh, that sort of sort of explained this document, which was uh, uh, discussed in, in unclassified form by the court, is that the detainee himself testified and others corroborated that when they were uh, arrested in a foreign country, they, um, there was an individual that came around that they thought was a correctional officer that actually asked for their full name and their family phone number and then said, I'll, I'll try to get this to somebody so that people could contact your families and you would be able to then uh, 
uh, so that they could know that you're detained, but that you're okay. So they gave names, they gave phone numbers. This was then published locally in a news report. And then it was picked up by various places and then existed on the internet in several different places. And then the, the Al Qaeda operative, whoever it is, then looked at this and downloaded this from the internet. So what starts out as a particularly compelling piece of evidence that would seem to show a very close relationship between an Al Qaeda operative and a uh, detainee then becomes something that's a lot more attenuated that a Al Qaeda operative downloaded a document from a news source or from an internet site um, and that is why it's on his computer. And then it doesn't mean that it's completely irrelevant. It could be that the fact that he downloaded this list means that he has some sort of interest in the people listed there, uh, an interest potentially in this specific detainee, and maybe there is some sort of relationship. But ultimately, the court sort of balancing all of these issues says when we look at all of these details, this piece of evidence um, is, is not truly sort of probative of the question before the court um, and finds it to be sort of much less useful and, and not very persuasive. So that's an example of um, sort of the tricky nature of the sort of thing where the original allegation, when you go back to it, all of that is entirely accurate based upon the uh, classified evidence that, you, that was then declassified, but it's a lot more nuanced than it at first appears here. All right, so that's one example that I will return to. Um, let's get out of this for a moment. Then I'll return to. Um, the second thing uh, that I wanted to sort of focus on up front is just talking a little bit about sort of the phases of this process, right? So uh, the first phase of this process from um, battlefield information to court is the sort of collection of battlefield information itself. And this is something where um, the traditional problem, of course, with battlefield information is the haphazard nature in which it's um, acquired. So uh, in uh, this captured records and related records, it was a conference from the 60s about Nuremberg and uh, the use of captured records. There was an article by Telford Taylor, who was one of the prosecutors in Nuremberg, and he was describing as one of the, the primary problems of the prosecution was that all of their evidence collection was, he called it parasitical, that we had to rely upon military intelligence units that were pulling documents for military intelligence purposes. There were interrogations that were done for intelligence purposes um, that are uh, that, that sometimes are useful, but sometimes they also did not contain things that we needed as prosecutors. And so it's more of a sort of a Venn diagram where there's some things that for intelligence purposes might be useful, but there are other things that are sort of missing from this process. And there was also the problem of sort of things sort of being grabbed sort of willy nilly in, uh, in a in sort of the chaos of an armed conflict. It's a, one of the uh, phrases that is used and in fact used by the, the court in uh, the, the case we were just looking at talked about sort of things being buried under the rubble of war, sort of context that is sort of disappears and will never be found as well. Um, now, in the past um, decades and recently, there has been a greater emphasis on this first phase of collection in terms of um, creating better training, better techniques. Um, for improving that part of this process and incorporating often sort of police forensic um, techniques in order to um, bag and tag, in order to uh, exploit uh, electronic material that you have, in order to take uh, fingerprints off of remnant material um, that helps um, uh, keep uh, the, the, as much context as possible, helps preserve uh, sort of the uh, um, chain of custody and contemplates the idea that some of the information that's being seized that might be useful for military intelligence purposes might also be something that will be used and is contemplated that it's possible use as evidence later on. So extra special care is taken with those. And these sort of things, sometimes you'll, you, uh, in, in sort of policy and training things, they're called sort of sensitive site exploitation. Uh, there's a lot of sort of training manuals and sort of guidance on this. So this is something that has sort of been developing over time and it is, uh, and, and in sort of recent discussions about this, you know, there's, there's talk about, okay, well, should this be 
should we have specially trained military doing this? Should we have more involvement by law enforcement? Should there be an international cadre of specialists that sort of approach these sort of places, uh, assuming sort of security uh, considerations permit in order to sort of do their work to sort of really capture uh, the documentation and context uh, that makes them appropriate for use later on in court cases. So that's the first phase that gets a lot of emphasis as it should. The last phase is sort of this, um, the end of uh, the usage of this material in a court case. And that's where you get sort of all the lawyers involved. It's like, okay, well, let's look at these issues of admissibility and evidentiary standards and what sort of procedures could be utilized for authenticating information and ensuring that we can, uh, the, thing, the, the chain of custody has been uh, protected throughout and this is now sort of a piece of evidence that this court should accept and what and when it is in the court, what sort of weight should be given to this sort of issue. So this is another area, this is the other phase where there's a, there has been a lot of emphasis and I think that there will be. Um, it, the, these create sort of unique sort of uh, granular and meaty legal issues that I think get uh, lawyers excited, and I, so I, I don't think there's any risk of this phase sort of being sort of ignored. Um, and I'll, I'll come to some of the other recommendations uh, that have been made recently about, about those in a bit. But the thing that I want to flag here up front is also this, the, the phase that's in between those two, uh, which is a bit more of a, uh, an opaque black box um, that is, a, the, where there's a lack of transparency, which is you get these materials uh, and then they are collected together and then they go into some sort of pool and this pool could be a database, it could be multiple databases. Um, and then some person or some team is then taking certain of these things, but not all of them, out that are then being identified for possible use as evidence in a case. Right, and this is um, one of these things that sort of doesn't get focused on, but from my experience in the sort of Guantanamo litigation, um, th this is sort of the crux of some of the sort of legitimacy issues of this sort of arc from collection to use in, in court that uh, I think needs a little bit more attention and perhaps a little more uh, clarity and, con and, and consistency. So just to give you uh, an example of this, so this is um, a different type of access issue. So um, in, the, in the first example, um, there was an access issue in terms of this is evidence that has been proffered. And there's a question about who has access to an unclassified version of this, who has access to the classified portions of it or an unredacted version of it. Um, but this is something that was put forward by uh, the government or in an analogy in, in, in a, uh, by the prosecution. But there's the other question of like, well, what other information is there that's relevant to this? So for, for this example, I'll give you another one from Guantanamo, which is when we got to the point of uh, the government providing the classified evidence, um, the justifying the detention of the teams, uh, you go to a secure facility and you open your file and there is the classified evidence uh, that the government is relying upon. And you start going through that and, it, and as I mentioned, a lot of this consists of battlefield type information, which could be uh, battlefield interrogations, could be documents that were found, computer data, it could be uh, something about pocket litter, what did they actually have in their pockets at the time they were captured, right? But let's take an example where um, there is an interrogation report of a, another detainee, and this other detainee says, um, oh yes, I know client number one, so I've got client number one's file here. That says, client number one, yes, I know that guy. That guy is Al-Qaeda. I, in fact, was with this guy in a tunnel in Tora Bora at the time Osama bin Laden was there. Um, and at the time, we were fighting against U.S. forces and the Northern Alliance. All right. So you have this report. And um, that could be the only thing from that detainee and the only thing to go on in that file. So this creates a, a sort of a tricky situation, because if there were the situation where this was a sort of a standalone prosecution or a standalone um, case, then that might be the only thing that the government has given you. And if you were in a situation where, okay, well, how do we evaluate this information, right? How do we, how do we find out more about this other detainee? Is this other detainee reliable? Is there 
Was this detainee uh, mistreated? Was this detainee uh, promised something? Is there uh, any other evidence that might suggest that this other detainee is, a, uh, is an unreliable source? Or does it turn out that this is a very reliable source and this is very strong evidence that, uh, that it undermines the, uh, our own case? Now, if you were to have only one case and with only that, you went forward to the, the government and said, hey, we would like um, other information about the detainee that uh, is interrogated in this interrogation. The government will say no. And if you took it to the court like that, I can uh, rehearse for you exactly what the government attorney would say. It would be like, your honor, this is outrageous. Uh, the, the representing detainees captured in an armed conflict. We shouldn't even be in court, but we're in court. We have now given them classified information, the relevant classified information, justifying their detention in this court. Um, and now, without any inkling or just pure speculation, they are now asking to undertake a fishing expedition into highly classified government files in the hopes that they might find something that might support their case where they have nothing to go on. So the court should deny any requests for discovery or deny requests for any additional documents. And I have to say, that sounds to me like a, a fairly persuasive argument, right? So in that case, um, the, you, you might sort of get, get, get stopped at the, uh, at, at the beginning here. Now, in certain prosecutions in, in the US in both state and federal court, there are certain obligations on prosecutors to provide information that they're aware of that could be of an exculpatory nature. Um, that you know, if they're aware of something that would seem to undermine their argument, they often do have an obligation to um, provide uh, discovery and, and disclose those to the defense. Um, although if you uh, put a defense attorney and a prosecutor in a room and have them argue about the proper parameters of that and whether or not prosecutors comply with that or they don't, it could end in a fist fight. Uh, but it is, uh, uh, it, it, there is a principle out there, right? But in, in the Guantanamo litigation, one aspect of it was that um, it was a sort of a unique situation where there wasn't just one client here and one client there, there were 800 detainees. And so uh, there was a desire by the, sort of the attorney teams that were working on this to try to ensure that any detainee that wanted an attorney could get an attorney. So cases were brought on behalf of many attorneys. So my, the team that I was working on, we had 14 detainees, all of them from Yemen. So we didn't just have file number on, on, on uh, client number one. We started to look at, and then you open client file number two and number three and number four and number five. And then what you start to see is, well, wait a second. Now I've got some information here in client number one's file, but I found stuff in client number six, seven, nine, and 13, additional information that seems highly relevant to client number one and vice versa, including you might find, for example, uh, the detainee accusing or saying that he was with client number one uh, at Tora Bora at a certain time could also be saying that client number six, he was also with that guy at around the same time, but they were in Kandahar or they were in Kabul or they were somewhere in Pakistan. And then you start to piece these together and you're like, well, wait, wait they're, they're, now that I have more access to more information, some of this is starting to not make sense. And it starts to sort of form this um, uh, sort of a greater structure of like, what, what are the other documents that might be out there and putting in a much stronger position to go back to a court and say, hey, uh, they said this was all the relevant information, but now we're finding this other information that we view as exculpatory or we view as um, undermining their argument. And they didn't give that to us in these cases. There's got to be more of this. Uh, there was also, uh, as part of that, sort of a, an even larger skirmish about, well, the government's taking the position that this is what we have the need to know under our security clearance, when in fact, uh, what we have found is that we have need to know information that is in other cases. And so then you eventually had a situation where you had sort of the secure facility where um, government records in all of these different cases were available, all of the sort of forms of battlefield information. Uh, that when you start comparing notes, oh, do you have a client that's on one of those lists? Oh, do you have a client that was accused by this? That when, when you start creating the larger pool of these documents, it's almost like sort of re-engineering 
the database that's on the other side that they're pulling from, and uh, some of us would argue that they're sort of cherry picking from, and then we're trying to reconstruct a bunch of that on the other side and then find the, the connections and find uh, sort of to evaluate their evidence with, with more uh, clarity. So this was, so this is another example of just this issue of who is choosing the evidence um, and, and what it is, uh, and what is its strength. Uh, and this is, so this is also something that is, can be a little bit unique to these types of battlefield information records. So going back to uh, the, the initial example of Nuremberg, for example, the uh, uh, Telford Taylor's piece, one of the points that he makes is just this one, which is um, the prosecution initially went in and said, okay, we have this evidence against these defendants. And then the uh, German lawyers then said, yeah, but what about the other evidence? And he describes, this is one of the central problems, he describes uh, the way he phrased it is, the Pentagon was really surprised by, shocked by, and uh, was not keen on the idea that German lawyers were asking and would be permitted to, as he phrased it, play ring around the rosy in a bunch of uh, DOD files um, that might be relevant to uh, this, the, uh, the prosecution and the, and the defense. So, and he said how it was in part resolved is that instead of having them somehow have access in the United States, sort of the main bodies of things, copies of those were sent um, and uh, were made available to uh, those attorneys to review to see if there was additional evidence in that pool that was um, uh, relevant to their defense of their clients, right? Another example of this, using captured records, uh, another uh, research topic that I had worked on before is sort of the, the legal status of um, records that U.S. forces captured in Panama in the invasion of Panama in 1989 that were then used um, in part and to uh, prosecute Manuel Noriega in U.S. federal court, uh, mostly on uh, drug charges, but there was a lot of the captured records that were used. Similarly, in that situation, the um, uh, defense counsel were saying the government is cherry picking a bunch of material from uh, of Panamanian records and they're just sitting on these in a giant facility down in Panama, we should have access to those. And ultimately they did get access to at least a significant portion of those records for them to go through to find uh, uh, potentially relevant evidence. So um, it's an illustration of uh, sort of this sort of issue that arises in these contexts. So the last thing I just wanna do is then now circle back to sort of some of these more recent um, developments. And I, and just for purposes of visuals, let me just share my screen and just show you a few of these. Um, uh, there is a number of these memorandums which are very easy to locate. If you Google battlefield information and evidence, you, you will instantly get on your screen a number of these more recent developments. Uh, Eurojust has a memorandum on battlefield evidence. Uh, DOD, DOJ, non-binding guideline principles in the use of battlefield evidence in civilian criminal proceedings, Abuja recommendations from the Global Counterterrorism for Forum that goes through uh, these sorts of issues, um, the United Nations guidelines on these. Um, and so there's a variety of these that are covering a lot of the same ground, although there are distinctions between them. Um, and uh, the main focus on these, and it's sort of interesting that sort of almost the exclusive focus on some of these is um, the issue of foreign terrorist fighters. So the, so the issue here is individuals that leave their home country, uh, they travel to a conflict zone such as Syria, or they travel to uh, another country like Iraq or elsewhere. While there, they may participate in armed conflict, they may participate in terrorist acts, they may participate in war crimes, they may participate in other sorts of criminal activity. And then just as quickly as they went there, they leave and return to their home country. So it creates a situation where um, there could be evidence of their involvement in criminal activity that is in the possession of military forces, intelligence agencies, um, nonprofits, the United Nations in that area, but they have no control over the person. Meanwhile, the person is back in their home country and their home country uh, government might 
be unaware of the activities they were involved in, or they might be aware of them, but they have insufficient evidence in order to sort of bring a charge against that individual. So these guidelines generally are talking about sort of greater cooperation in this area in order to share this sort of information and including, uh, you know, how, how do we get to um, information that might be in the hands of military authorities or intelligence authorities and get it to a prosecutor, a national prosecutor, in a way that can be utilized by that prosecutor as sort of admissible evidence at trial, um, consistent with um, sort of all of the sort of the obstacles that you have there. And what about problems of uh, some of the information is classified, or the source or method of uh, how it was obtained is classified? Um, and what about you know are there any restrictions on admissibility of things coming from the military? Um, the other aspect of this is sort of these different sort of papers and, and discussions of this issue have not sort of been unanimously thought to be a good thing. There is also uh, the Special Rapporteur for Protection of Human Rights has a uh, April 20, 2021 um, paper on sort of uh, her position on some of these efforts, uh, including things like being concerned that they're called guidelines when they really are sort of, which seems like it's a more, uh, a stronger, uh, piece of almost soft law versus things that are sort of at the discussion sort of general level. Uh, and a few things that I would say about this, uh, a couple of things. One is um, what I see in these materials and what's being sort of contemplated by this as somebody who um, is sort of looking at it from the sort of an academic standpoint of uh, focusing on things like captured records, right? That they are uh, they're doing a very positive thing in terms of uh, sort of focusing on sort of that collection process um, and the um, uh, sort of issues having to do with admissibility. But I think that um, I also feel like there is uh, sort of a, a connection to the some of the examples that I've given you that creates sort of a unique problem here, which is that um, the sort of pool of these materials from which evidence is being drawn um, creates a, a unique situation where the person controlling that information might not be the same government that is doing the prosecuting. And so in my example of the Guantanamo cases where, uh, or in the, in the Nuremberg example, where the prosecutor is also the one or a related government is the one that has these materials so that access to them could be granted. Here you have a situation where you potentially have sort of cherry picked information that's being used, um, which potentially raises uh, fair trial concerns and sort of access to the same level of information. Uh, the uh, special reporter, uh, one of the things that uh, she raises is that um, there are um, references throughout all these documents to sort of the fair trial concerns and there's sort of references to them um, in passing, but that they don't necessarily feel like those considerations have been sort of baked in to uh, these procedures. And there's a sort of a lot of work to be done there. The final thing I will say is that, um, uh, especially in sort of in, in, in the US document, um, it, there, there seems to be sort of a suggestion that um, uh, a lot of these sort of recommendations and things are based on uh, sort of the US's experience with these. Um, but then I find that hard to uh, reconcile with my uh, sort of experience with that and what and what I what I've seen in terms of especially in terms of things like um, should there be special rules do we need special rules for classified information do we need special training for judges in the U.S. experience uh, the most significant modern and still ongoing example of uh, battlefield information being used for criminal prosecution of accused terrorists is the U.S. military commissions process which um, has been sort of a mess. And more than two decades after 9-11, the main 9-11 uh, defendants are still sort of migrated in pre-trial considerations and they, there has been no trial. And part of that is of course, the, the problem that some of the battlefield information obtained that the government had wanted to use directly or indirectly is information that was obtained via means that at least violated international law and probably should constitute crimes in terms of torture and cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment. Um, whereas in contrast to 
um, the U.S. experience, which is the most effective and efficient prosecutions of terrorism suspects in the United States have been things that have happened in normal courts with normal judges and normal rules of evidence in the federal court system. Uh, there they follow tried and true standards. They recognize, as the uh, a judge did in the Guantanamo case, that there can be some sort of unique issues here, but they can adjust to those. They handle everything from complicated civil trials to very complicated criminal trials having to do with financial uh, um, complications. And they, they, they are more than up to the task to sort of handle these issues. And so that's a final thing that's sort of raised by the special reporter is, um, is there, are, are we saying now that there's a special problem here and special rules should apply? And is that really consistent with um, uh, what, what is in, as necessary or should we try the normal path to ensure that sort of all of the normal fair trial considerations are, are accounted for. So I will, will end my sort of introduction on that. Doug, thanks. That, that was really fascinating. Of course, I think I think everything our speakers say is fascinating anyways, and that's why we have, have the speakers come um, to talk about these things. But I, I'm really intrigued by, by a few specific points um, raised in your, in, in your talk. I think before I, suggest my questions, I'll just remind um, the attendees uh, that they can post their questions in the Q&A function. Uh, I see one or two names uh, that I know and others that I don't, uh, but I hope to know, I get to know them eventually. I see Matthew Ford, who was our last speaker, uh, one of our last two speakers, who dealt with a lot of these issues from a more theor theoretical and critical perspective. Um, and so I'm, I'm expecting to see some, some interesting provocative questions, no pressure. Um, I, I suppose I'll, I'll kick things off with, with um, these, these, these might be sort of peculiar kind of questions, but I guess as a, as a non-lawyer, somebody trained as an historian, but he's worked in some of the same environments that, that you've been talking about. I'm, I, I was intrigued by the, the examples of documents that you showed us at the beginning of the talk. Um, going from an information report that wasn't a finalized intelligence report, which to my historian's mind would actually make it more valuable because it's closer to the original source. And you know the validation as an intelligence document would take us further away. There's more applied judgment, more analysis, but actually gets us further away from the, the nuggety detail that maybe historians would be looking for in primary documents. And I guess I, I, one of the things that I've been, I've been sort of playing with, again, not, not coming from you know, legal training, but historian's training, where we're used to thinking about primary and secondary and tertiary documents, really primary and secondary documents, and how that meshes or doesn't at all, um, depending on your point of view, with, with the wider world of documentary evidence and where that fits with what we're talking about you know, when we're talking about battlefield evidence and battlefield information. And I'm just wondering if, we, I mean, without putting you on the spot and turning this into a talk about documentary evidence, uh, I'm just wondering if you, if you could possibly address that. Is there, is there common ground between, you know, the historian's interest in primary, secondary, tertiary documents and, you know, what that means in terms of, you know, the, the, the further you get from first observed um, detail or first recorded detail, um, you know, is there, is there some common ground between these two kinds of, ways of looking at documentary evidence or, or are they irreconcilable? I know there, there's, a, there's, a thread in the, in, there's a thread in the academic literature on forensic history that deals with this. And that's not really the focus of our talk, but I, I think it's implied that there's a strong implication of this in some of what you're pointing out by looking at these kinds of intelligence documents and how they're sequenced in terms of, you know, at what point in the process they're understanding what it is that, that they're looking at versus you know, actually capturing information or documenting the information as it was in its original form. Yeah. I, I guess it's more of a provocation and a yeah. comment than a question, but I was just wondering if you could maybe address yeah, that. Yeah, So it raises a, a number of uh, issues that sort of came up in the case and uh, that I've sort of struggled with in, in other contexts as well, which is, you know, there is an interesting thing, which is, um, you know, the intelligence report being sort of unfinished and it's sort of, here is just, here, there is something to that that also, there have been situations where there's been uh, information that sort of the argument is that it, it is actually um, 
more reliable, something could be more reliable because there's also a built-in incentive for the person creating this document who's working in military intelligence to be as accurate as possible because they are serving a larger interest um, there. There, there was, um, in terms of sort of, and I'll start with, I'll come back to this with the evidentiary point, but in terms of the types of information, so this was something that um, I remember the moment of seeing some of these documents for the first time and I was like, wow, because again, having been in the, the army, having been involved in intelligence collection and in, in the creation of um, intelligence reports, like my, my view, uh, my, my, the, the, that part of my mind about uh, an intelligence purpose and then my, part of my mind about evidence, like they don't mesh very well because from a, an intelligence perspective, I had always, you know, the, the threshold for when you send a report is not particularly high because, and it's by design on the idea that, uh, you know, you're sending a data point into a larger, uh, a larger structure. And it could be that um, the information that you put into it um, when combined with other things could make it more significant um, or it could turn out to not be insignificant. It also, when the person is sending an intelligence report, there also is, sometimes it's caveated on it. And sometimes it's just understood that the consumer of this will understand that this is the information we got but this information could turn out to be inaccurate or it could be misleading or, or somebody could have intentionally given information that was misleading uh, to sort of undermine uh, the intelligence process. Um, so that was, uh, so the idea of that being sort of used as evidence was, was a bit um, uh, confusing at first. And I will also say one of the things that is um, mentioned in some of these documents is the need to educate judges about these types of materials. And sort of reading the documents, I interpret that as being primarily looking at the idea of like, well, we can educate judges in some of these national courts about well, what is what are all these intelligence processes that we do and in order to sort of build confidence in the use of them as evidence. Um, but I also, from my perspective, was like, oh, yes, we need to do some training. If we're going to do some training, we need to look at all the different sides of it. And this was, uh, this was sort of rehearsed in miniature in the Guantanamo litigation. So one of the very first exhibits on the government side was a document drafted by the Defense Intelligence Agency that was literally called Intelligence 101. And it walked through all of these things about, well, this is how intelligence is collected. These are the different actors in SIGINT and HUMINT and this is all, here's the intelligence cycle. And it walked through for, for tens of pages and it, um, all of it is perfectly accurate. Um, but then the way that it sort of then gets used is sort of then the DOJ on top of this is then sort of puts the gloss on and ergo, um, these things we should be able to rely on. Yes, there's pieces of this that are either are unfinished intelligence, but there are things that are part of this process and there's quality control that goes into this and all of these layers of review. So what, what we should be able to feel comfortable relying upon this. So the detainee attorneys also then did the, a similar form of education um, in the other direction by uh, one of it, one, uh, one that was used and we used it in ours was a, a declaration uh, that some of the attorneys got from a retired senior CIA a uh, person that was in operations in East Asia. Um, and he did this very detailed declaration being like, um, you, here's what you need to know about this pool of message traffic that is in this. You know, the unfinished reports are about all kinds of things. And the sort of level of uh, the threshold for sending them as I was mentioning is, is low and the quality of a lot of this is low. And so he used some examples. And of course, his whole declaration had to be sort of done through pre-publication review through the CIA to ensure it didn't include classified information, but it included things like there is a report in that same system that says somebody saw Osama bin Laden on a, a US naval base in East Asia and he was at the Navy Post Exchange shopping. And he said, you know, this is in that system. There's a, another system saying that there's going to be an attack on a military base in a country in which the U.S. has never had a military base. That, and he was making the point that especially after 9-11, there was a, a push towards reporting everything on the fear that something is going to get lost uh, and that somebody's going to get blamed for not raising an alarm about a, a threat in one of these reports. So his larger point 
is that, yeah, if somebody goes through and wants to cherry pick pieces of information out of this, they could sort of do that in order to support a narrative, uh, you know, any narrative that they, they, they choose, there might be some support for it in that system. But in terms of the evidence, uh, you know, the, the general focus of, uh, of, of evidence in court trials is, is something that is very direct. Uh, is there a person, you know, we, we want this person to testify, we want this person's direct eyewitness testimony, and then this also goes to, uh, you know, the rights of um, cross-examination, and so that the, both sides can both sort of question that person, and even though, and I guess this sort of gets also into sort of academic things, you know, the, the idea of memory and people's recollection of things is actually uh, in some ways um, less reliable than perhaps sort of things that are taken in sort of a, a specific time and place, um, that uh, was, was closer to the actual events. There is also this other issue of sort of hearsay and that this raises a lot of, uh, from a legal perspective in terms of somebody saying what somebody else said rather than sort of a, a direct evidence of it. But there are a number of, uh, you know, exceptions to that in situations where there is high probability that the person that's reporting the information um, would be as accurate as possible in doing so. So there's somebody calling 911 and they hear somebody say something and you know, they're in an exigent circumstance, they're, they're not gonna be sort of trying to come up with something. Uh, sometimes hearsay can be allowed in those um, situations because simply because the, 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 when you look at that totality of that situation, that reporting of what somebody else said, somebody else said is, is more reliable because of the, the, the circumstances. And, um, so I, yeah, I think there is definitely something there. And in terms of uh, some of these reports talk about like you know, the importance of, uh, or, the, or the, that some countries need to consider sort of making changes to their evidentiary standards to allow classified information or change evidentiary standards to allow certain types of information from certain types of sources. Um, but the, and it's often looked at sort of as a, a light on and off switch in terms of like, is something admissible or is it not? when um, some of the experiences have been that uh, some of the courts may allow something and recognize that it's not necessarily the best evidence or that it, it's, it's not, wasn't created under um, ideal circumstances, um, but that, that, that question should go more sort of the weight of the, that they might give this evidence, not whether they would even look at it at all. Um, but that is, uh, um, but uh, yeah, as a historian, and that's the, that's the other part I would just, just end on is the other part of, I'm always in favor of techniques and greater uh, collection and preservation of documents, whether they're, that's for intelligence purposes or uh, prosecution purposes, in part on the expectation that those sorts of materials will also be preserved for sort of historical research when somebody finally returns back to um, consider these issues. So, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good cue for some of the other questions I have, but of course it raises more. <laughs> um, uh, I, I guess I'll follow up with, with something. I mean, you, 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 over the course of your talk, you talked about, a, a, you mentioned specifically measures to make this kind of information more credible that have been implemented over time. And actually, actually I think you were talking about forensics specifically, but there were the introduction of forensics into say DOCX or Domex practices, you know, bring, bringing that in. But I think you, you, you know, you, you addressed it a couple of different ways. One is authoritative framing. Um, you know, this, this is, you know, these are defense de department documents, therefore you should take them more seriously, that sort of thing. And of course, then there's the kind of socialization of, of, of battlefield inf information, battlefield evidence through the, you know, sort of the formalization and institutionalization of its use or potential use in, in criminal proceedings. Um, and then, and then you've got forensics introduction of you know techniques, um, approaches, methods, techniques to to uh, better preserve uh, contextually and and in its entirety this this kind of information in its original form as it was found. And and just I, I guess the question that I that I that I've been asking um, in thinking about forensic history and and forensic. Uh, various kinds of forensic ways of thinking about things, forensic aesthetics, as one academic has, has put it, that's, that's emerged, you know, since really since the Second World War as a way of looking at, at, at these things as they become sort of prominent and public uh, issues. 
and I guess it goes to your, your black box problem. And on the one hand, and I'm wondering if there's a tension here, you know, on the one hand, you have um, this thinking that, you know, bringing in forensic approaches should be, could be, should be kind of the default setting. Uh, because while we're doing one kind of research, it may also have uh, applications or it may at some point uh, have to be used or should be used in, in a court of law. Um, but at the other, on the other side, you, you've got kind of what, you know, this black box, black box problem that, that you told me about that introduces kind of a visibility gap in, you know, what should be a transparent process. Forensics is about being able to track when and where and what exactly um, in the handling of, of evidence. And, and you've got kind of this tearline forensics, which seems to be sort of contradictory in, in terms, in, 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 in how it's applied. And I'm wondering if it discredits itself. So on the one hand, is it more credible or less credible to be bringing this in? It's just kind of a, a big question, question mark for me. And I'm just wondering if there's a tension built into this. I mean, I think clearly there is. I'm just, I, I suppose, I, I wonder what you think of that. Yes, yeah, that I hadn't looked at it from sort of, uh, I think that I, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, like, I, I wonder um, whether I have often wondered whether there's a, um, whether there's also a tension between uh, sort of the normal uses of the, the, the collection. I wonder whether, for example, is intelligence collection somehow undermined in part or the intelligence purposes of it if, if the main focus is sort of uh, a forensic model that is sort of looking, if, if there is looking too much at it towards, well, could this be used as evidence, right? Or is that sort of a, a movement of resources towards that sort of goal um, versus uh, a usage from a, uh, uh, a broader usage for sort of intelligence purposes and whether they are gonna, uh, whether US forces would think that like they're, they're sort of diverting resources towards one thing when they really should be focused on their primary responsibility uh, for the military. Um, and, you know, I wonder, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not sure that I have a great answer to your, uh, to your, your positive there. I mean, it's, um, I do, and I, I do feel like also they, you know, the black box is also, you know, what, what is this, what, what, what survives of this black box later and what sort of meaningful, um, access will there be down the line? And I, you know, I, I wonder whether, uh, you know, the, um, the historian coming behind, if he, if he uh, seeing something that is, there, there might be forensic information of a very specific type and as to very specific things, but I wonder whether there's something lost that is uh, sort of um, a wider variety of types of material and reporting of material that uh, at the end of the day could end up being sort of more useful for, for research, but. Um, yeah, I, I think this will, this will be a good question for you and I to, to keep probing, I suppose. Uh, later, it, you know, it's one of those things that's swirling around and I'm not sure if there's a, a definitive sort of point on that, but it's worth, definitely worth exploring. I mean, the, the, the black box, you know, you're talking, we're, we're talking about a kind of a closed system that's not, you know, part of it, as you said, it's, it's opaque, it's not meant to be, it's by design sort of closed and not open to everybody. So, so that creates um, a problem of, of verifiability, I suppose. Um, and I just, I'm just thinking of sort of a parallel kind of black box, if you will, in terms of technology approaches, especially recently, especially in some of the documentation, the guidelines that you cited, where, you know, you're dealing with battlefield information and like other kinds of information, the plague of the last, you know, 15, 20 years is volume. There's so much of it is how do you deal with it? And so you got a different kind of box where a lot of this is being pushed in sorted, sifted, and then meaning is being extracted or the relevant datum is being extracted. And I'm just, maybe, maybe there's another sort of interesting, I, I guess, parallel sets of boxes where things are rendered opaque in, in, a, in, a, in an effort to make them more meaningful. But again, is it more, it, does it end up just contradicting itself in some way? Or, or are these improvements and we just no, have to I, get I, used, I, we just have to get used to it. <laughs> I think it's a great point, and it, it is something that, that comes up in sort of uh, the legal world of sort of discovery generally, the idea that it used to be where uh, this is how a bunch of junior lawyers used to be employed for weeks on end was, oh, our company has X thousand boxes of material that we might need to disclose the other side, and so there's all these attorneys going through page by page, and now there is 
the development of sort of AI that where they scan all these documents in and it, they will say, these are the types of documents that are relevant that we need to produce and they'll plug those in and then the, the machine will learn and will identify and sort of stack all these documents of like, these are the ones where there's a certain percentage that these are relevant. Um, and, you know, I, th I think there, there is something to that, which is one, the old school way of doing it and the old school way of that we view it as like somebody's going through and pulling these out is not how it's being done, but also to the extent that, um, and also there could be problems with sort of if what, what AI is being used and what it's actually being able to find. But I wonder whether that also could sort of neutralize it in certain ways in terms of um, if there is some sort of a, um, an automated process or something that is sort of helping to go through all the data or all the material uh, that could sort of uh, create what um, is ultimately sort of produced as being sort of more uh, more accurate, more full, uh, and more better coverage. And I and I definitely want to make clear that you know I I don't mean to suggest in the Gitmo cases that um, you know there was any there was necessarily an attempt to conceal information or utilize the black box as something like oh we're just going to cherry pick. But I also feel like there's um, this is part of the question that arises um, with these. Um, uh, these questions of like who's doing what, where, um, and this is why this type of battlefield information I think creates a unique problem, which is in the normal sort of criminal prosecution, you have a much closer relationship between the uh, prosecutor and law enforcement and sort of the procedures that law enforcement use and how they handle evidence. Um, uh, so there's a, uh, um, so that there's a, uh, sorry, just lost my train of thought. There's a uh, a use of it that. Um, oh yeah, so there, there's more of a a clear idea of like, well, this is what's this is what's available, and the uh, the prosecutor has more of a a balance to uh, a view of what the full material is. So in, in terms of fulfilling their duties to um, sort of provide exculpatory information, if it is um, if it is available, that that's more available to them. And so in these situations where it's like, okay, well, wait, if, if there's a greater attenuation between sort of the prosecutor and the prosecutor taking their responsibilities very seriously to provide relevant information and it's being handled by someone else, it's not necessarily meaning that the other, someone else is less reliable or less honest, but I do feel like you have a uh, situation where they may not understand their job or understand what the prosecutor's job in the same way in terms of finding um, relevant and perhaps uh, exculpatory information. I've actually, there, there's a question posted in the q and I, I looked down and I saw uh, a number um, and it's it's from Matthew. So just so you're aware, Matthew Ford is, as I mentioned, the, the, he, he spoke at the, uh, he's one of the two co-speakers at the last, um, at the last event in our speaker series. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Sussex um, and actually a, a P, War Studies PhD graduate of, of the War Studies department. Um, uh, he's posted a question here, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read it out. Thanks, Matthew. The, I came in late and have had to listen while other things have been going on in the background. I wonder what that might be. Indeed, um, there are a couple of other things going on in the world right now. So um, thanks for taking the time to, to join in. Um, Matthew writes, apologies if you've already discussed my question, but here goes. In a conflict environment, people adjust what they record and say based on who their particular context uh, and level on their particular context and level of security or insecurity. How do you get around the challenge of individuals self-censoring? Is this just a question of verifying data points? Is there a hierarchy of evidence? And how do you manage that in practice? How do we manage the challenge? And how many people do we need? Um, you can do this sort of activity. And then there's, you know, apologies if this is a, a naive sort of question um, and he's still thinking it through. Um, this, this would be a great trio to sit down with, uh, with uh, beer maybe at Waterloo Station, Matthew, and, uh, and pick it up. Uh, I think you've got the question visible to you as well, Doug. Um, so I don't know if you want to work your way through them or focus on one of them. Yeah, so I... I, I uh, uh... Thank you, Matthew, for the uh, uh, the question. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, what I think is, is the thing is that there are sort of situations, sort of legal situations 
that are in the sort of more normal sort of uh, national context where some of this stuff can arise a bit where you're talking about, you know, a, is there a witness that is, um, that is um, hesitant to come forward? Is there, or is being sort of, um, doesn't feel comfortable um, talking about something or the, the, you know, somebody needs uh, protection or somebody that has been a victim of um, a crime that, uh, it's sort of in that uh, mode where they have the most relevant information, or they have at least some of the most relevant information, but they're not in a position to uh, sort of provide it. Um, and sort of then, then they are looking for other evidence to sort of, um, to sort of supplement what's available there. I think um, uh, it's a, I think it is a challenge in, in, in sort of, Trying to think that through, especially when you then expand that to a sort of a, a very uh, sort of a, a national or a, a local type situation to these broader questions where you might have things that involve sort of war crimes and uh, uh, victims of who are then also in a place where there is a, um, you know, they, they're not free to provide their um, evidence as well or, or provide their um, uh, information. So yeah, I think that is a, uh, a problem with anything that is sort of the transnational nature of this, I think adds a whole other layer of, of problems. And I know um, uh, from a very different standpoint, I, I spent a summer working at the International Criminal Tribunal for uh, Rwanda. Uh, and there were there were issues like this where they had to, um, you know, there was a witness that was needed for a to, to establish a certain crime and they had, maybe they had some documentary evidence or they had some other evidence, but they needed the evidence from very specific person that could provide something that the, the court needed, but they couldn't get otherwise where um, there had to be extreme measures undertaken in order to protect that person and allow them uh, the space and security to uh, provide that uh, testimony. And so there were, I've heard there were even things where, you know, somebody would travel to the local city. So the, the, the court was in Tanzania and so many of the, uh, 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 the witnesses were in Rwanda. And so there would be somebody that would travel and present as somebody's cousin. And they would talk to that person in private. And then when that person was, um, uh, if that person was willing to testify, they were sort of taken. It was almost like they were going on a traveling trip and there was security and all of these things in order to bring this person uh, to the trial and allow them to sort of provide their testimony with, uh, with some protections for security in order to get that piece of evidence in order to sort of make the case. Um, but I, I think also in this, the idea of self-censoring that like, you know, if there are situations where people are not willing or cannot provide relevant evidence, you do end up in a situation of trying to find uh, some additional source to sort of uh, provide that evidence. I'm going to I'm going to ask I think one more question and that's going to that's going to take us to I think um probably as much time as we can spend on this but you know we you and I can hang back and and chat some more um and I guess the question I'll put the question this way is the, when we're talking about recent developments and the series of guide well, not a series of guidelines but the different sorts of guidelines that have emerged between you know the the US uh, guidelines, the couple of different U.S. guidelines, the Eurojust uh, statement, and, and a couple of other um, uh, documents uh, that, that are sort of acknowledging this publicly, formalizing it, institutionalizing, socializing the idea. Um, you know, on the, and, and you mentioned part of this explicitly where you said, you know, that there seems to be sort of a strong U.S. influence, and a lot of this is a reflection of the U.S. experience. And, and indeed, there's a there's a, you know, there's a really strong history of this going back, you know, 75 years, probably a, quite a bit longer than that, but from the Second World War onwards in terms of, you know, the, the approaches to captured enemy documents and the doctrines that de de developed around that and how that's played out post-war in the Second World War and then the versions of it have been, um, you know, applied as part of, you know, predictive classic sort of intelligence activity, but that have also come into play into you know post-war documentation activity 
in relation to human rights, core international crimes, really. Um, and that, that happened after the Second World War. And then you had versions of that, you know, in relation to, well, every, every uh, battlefield situation the U.S. was involved in, but also every major sort of genocide or large-scale core international crime. You had documentation centers coming up, you know, uh, being developed um, in, in a very official sense, but also ad hoc um, through civil society, you know, activities. Um, after the Second World War in, in, in you know, Cambodia, DC CAM, the Documentation Center Cambodia, prime example of that. Um, and then those records being you know, uh, used fairly explicitly in, in the, the formalized uh, criminal tribunal or, or criminal sort of, uh, well, criminal tribunal for lack of a better, I, I can't remember the formal title of it for, for Cambodia, as well as in Rwanda and the Balkans, and then you know, over the last couple of decades as well. And so you've got this really strong trajectory built into this now public formalization of battlefield information and battlefield evidence as potentially viable uh, courtroom evidence coming out of an intelligence history. But you've also got you know, a democratization of access that's come into play, especially over the last 10, 20 years probably longer than that because there's always been some sort of democratic access to information or let's say let's say popular access as opposed to officially you know controlled activities um, but but now with with the usual sort of you know emerging technologies and, and Matthew's question about you know recording information and and uh, and, and uh, who gets to do that and how they record how they self-censor and all of that and and so you've got two things coming into play when it comes to these guidelines coming out now these recent developments um, that that sort of help us look at at this at battlefield information in a in a in a more transparent way, I suppose. And it's coming out of on the one hand this closed black box, right? And on the other hand, you've got you know de democratized democratized access uh, facilitated by new technologies, recording technologies, and this sort of ubiquitous um, ability to record and to uh, broadcast that information. And so, you know, low visibility versus extreme visibility um, uh, activities. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, a, a lot of your talk and a lot of what you had to say about these guidelines was really coming from, from an intelligence perspective or how they relate to, you know, how intelligence feeds into that. And I'm just wondering what you, what, what you, what you think about that, that more democratic aspect of things. I should probably stop saying democratic and, and, and focus more on the civil society side of things. Um, where it's 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 recorded and presented, and by design to to be sort of consumed publicly, in a classic sense, forensically. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the, those two things coming together, um, and the, yeah, the idea that uh, there are sort of the citizen recorders of all sorts of evidence and all sorts of uh, of things that are are and then the then the wide availability of that is allowing everybody to sort of see things that would have been sort of concealed or 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 um uh, hidden before so and the, the one takeaway from your, your question or one angle that i would come at it is, is something that i have thought about in looking at these guidelines which is there's a part of me that is a little bit surprised by their narrow scope that like they're talking to like the idea of um, the larger justification for these guidelines is the idea which I, I can get behind and I think most people get behind, which is that we want to increase accountability for crimes committed in conflict zones. Um, and increasing accountability for that hopefully creates a deterrent so that there is less of these sorts of crimes occurring. But I find it a little interesting that that broader goal, which could have a lot of other things added to it, um, is then focused on this very specific foreign terrorist fighter problem um, about that we're, we're only applying it to this specific thing. Um, and I, your, your, your thought about sort of citizen uh, and, and democratic access to, like I, I was reminded and I had thought about these in terms of, um, and obviously in terms of things like genocide, in terms of things that are happening where people are documenting it and civil society is stepping in and providing documentation that they can make fully available to others to sort of shed a light on things that are happening. But I was also reminded, you know, in terms of if we did have a situation where um, we were increasing sort of the capacity to document 
in these conflict zones, and including that, and that could include either people that are, you know, jointly acting as intelligence for something, but they are also uh, sort of feeding into this. But if you also had sort of, and especially the involvement of sort of the United Nations and international organizations, if you sort of broaden that a bit, and the idea of having sort of an international cadre of people that are sort of focused on documenting crimes and conflict zones that is not necessarily tied to sort of, well, this initiative by the United States and they're pushing NATO and this organization is here. I mean, there are possibilities there that, that part of me thinks is um, uh, unrealistic, but there's part of me that thinks, well, what about these situations where there is something that happens in a conflict zone, such as a drone strike or an airstrike and the United States immediately says that, oh, all those were combatants. And then you have a local reporter who takes a picture of the scene and you see old people and children killed. Uh, and there's a part of me that's like, well, if we're improving the documentation of conflict zone actions, including things that could potentially constitute crimes or violations of the law of our conflict, um, I also, Wonder, well, well why, why don't we, could we expand this and, and including the idea that there are people that are out there sort of able to document things that are near them um, that could add um, uh, sort of legitimacy, so sort of add additional facts or at least documents and, and, and evidence for either the sort of public discussion and uh, or if, if there is any sort of uh, litigation to be done related to things uh, as sort of another source of this. And if, if, if there were international organizations and, and civil society that were sort of helping to facilitate this as well. Um, and because I feel like those, when I read sort of the main purpose of some of these guidelines, I feel like, well, this seems consistent. Although I, of course, understand the idea that um, if you start focusing on actions of state actors, um, it, it takes on a very different, um, a very different uh, sort of uh, feeling, and uh, and and it, the the the, uh, um, and the 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 interest in that suddenly suddenly changes a bit. So I I, I should have cued this with with you know this is your talk, Doug. Uh, you, you get to have the final say. That was actually a really great closing statement if you want it to be. But but actually now that I'm cueing it, I I, I guess I, I would say now. Um, you know, you, this, this is your talk, so um, you, you get to have the final say. Any, any sort of closing words or points or observations that you want to that you want to leave us with? Uh, no, I just I just want to say thank you. I uh, really enjoyed this and I have been watching with uh, the uh, conflict record unit with uh, great interest uh, from a distance, but with great interest. And I, you know, I think this uh, I think the issue of conflict records is a is the perfect thing for an interdisciplinary approach. And what I love about these issues are that I am constantly reminded of how little I know, that uh, when you, you look at things from sort of a legal angle and then somebody comes in with a historical political science angle that just sort of adds a whole other layers of nuance. Um, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a topic that I, it's just a gift that keeps on giving. And I uh, sort of, uh, I'm happy to uh, be here and I, uh, uh, look forward to the, the work of the conflicts record unit in the future. That's 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 a brilliant plug, and for the record, it wasn't rehearsed. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't prompt Doug to say that. So thank thank you very much. That that's exactly what we aspire to, and this was this was a, a great um, a great way to do it. Having this talk with you was a, a great way to do it. I look forward to more of it in the future. Yes. So so watch this space. <laughs>